from the heart of our nation's capital, here's Family Research Council President Tony Perkins. Well, good afternoon and welcome to Washington Watch. Thanks for joining us as we take you beyond the headlines to hear directly from our nation's leaders and newsmakers in the pursuit of truth on the issues that matter most to you and your family. And we do it all from a biblical worldview. I'm your host, Tony Perkins, and Washington Watch starts now. So I reject the ruling of the International Court of Justice. I reject the arrest warrants of the ICC. And I will do everything in my power to make sure the ICC is sanctioned by the Congress because we're next. I'm going to tell every member of the Senate and the House, if you don't stand up for the ICC now and push back hard, we're next. That was South Carolina Senator Lindsey Graham yesterday from Tel Aviv commenting on the International Criminal Court's issuance of an arrest warrant for Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu. When the House returns next week, the plan is to pass legislation sanctioning the ICC, but the Biden administration is attempting to derail that vote. As it relates to uh, legislation, as it relates to specific sanctioning, that particular question, this is not something that the administration uh, is going to support. We do not believe is an effective or an appropriate uh, path forward, appropriate tool to address uh, what our concerns, the United States concerns are on the ICC. Uh, so we're going to work, work with Congress on other options. That, of course, was White House Press Secretary Karine Jean-Pierre earlier this week. We're going to talk with Florida Congressman Mike Waltz a little bit later about this legislation. And guess who is upset with lawmakers in my home state of Louisiana? The ACLU, Americans United for the Separation of Church and State, and the Southern Impoverished Law Center. All of them anti-Christian organizations. So why are they upset? I'm going to tell you when State Representative Dodie Horton joins me later. The WHO doesn't know when to stop. FRC's Travis Weber will join us from the 77th World Assemb Health Assembly in Geneva with an update on the World Health Organization's attempted global power grab. That's coming up later. And you want to know what is at stake in this election? Do you want to know what's at stake? Well, here's a clip from President Joe Biden campaigning in Philadelphia yesterday. Guess what? The next president, they're going to be able to appoint a couple of justices, and I'll be if they're not going to happen. Look, if in fact we're able to change some of the justices when they retire and put in re really progressive judges like we've always had, tell me that won't change your life. A moment of truth like we always have. Progressive judges who will legislate from the bench. That's what's just one of many things that are at stake in this coming election. Well, former secretary of the Department of Housing and Urban Development, Dr. Ben Carson, will join me in studio. Also, I'll have information on how you can join us tonight for a live event at the Faith and Freedom Chapel in Baton Rouge when Dr. Carson joins us for a conversation. That's coming up on this edition of Washington Watch. Check out the website, Tony Perkins. Com. Well, last night, the Israeli military announced it had taken tactical control of the uh, corridor which runs along the border between Gaza and Egypt and serves as a crucial supply line for Hamas to rearm itself through cross-border smuggling. Well, as Israel continues to make progress, the Biden administration insists on providing minimal support for the Jewish state, slow-walking weapons, and then this week confirming it will not support sanctions on the International Criminal Court for its overreach by seeking arrest warrants for Israeli leaders. So what message does this send to the international community? Joining me now to discuss this is Congressman Mike Waltz. He serves on the House Permanent Select Committee on Intelligence and the House Foreign Affairs Committee. He represents the 6th Congressional District of Florida, and he is a retired colonel from the United States Army. Congressman Waltz, welcome back to Washington Watch. Hey, thanks, Tony. Uh, always a blessing to be with you. Well, it's good to see you. And I know the the Congress has been out this week for Memorial Day, um, but the White House still making news, announcing this week that it will oppose a sanctions bill against the International Criminal Courts that is teed up uh, to be moved next week when Congress returns. Your reaction? Well, a couple of things that I would just add to your lead in there, uh, Tony. One, 
uh, Secretary of State, Biden's Secretary of State, Antony Blinken, uh, initially reacted to uh, the, the indictments from the criminal court on a duly and freely elected uh, prime minister and, and, uh, and minister of defense in Israel, Blinken reacted that this was absurd, that it was ridiculous, that it was in line with a long history of absurd uh, uh, rulings from the ICC, including going after members of the United States military uh, in the past. And then the other thing I would add, Tony, and this is uh, what explains the shift from the administration, from Blinken saying it was absurd to now Biden's spokesperson saying we're going to oppose sanctions. And that's the members of the squad and the progressive left and their supporters all cheerleading for the ICC going after Israel and going after Netanyahu. So once again, this is international American foreign policy being made for what's good or bad for Biden in an election year and his play to his progressive Democratic base, uh, yeah. period. That's all that's that's all this is about, because everyone knows the ICC is anti-American, anti-Israel uh, and has been. And, and Lindsey Graham's exactly right. Uh, by not standing up, we're opening Pandora's box here for them to come after us next. Yeah, you know, uh, Congressman Waltz, a really good point in terms of pointing out what's behind the shift. But, but I want to I want to elaborate on that because this is not the first time we've seen the administration take a pro-Israel position, which would be natural for us to support our ally, only to reverse course. Mm -hmm. That would tell me that if you're not you know you don't change policy overnight within your administration unless you are not founded on some kind of principle. I mean, and you're absolutely right. This is driven by politics, not by the principle yep. of the position. Well, that's absolutely right. Uh, you saw you saw Blinken's reaction for a, for a change. That was actually the right reaction from the Secretary of State. But then he ran into Biden's political operation that said, no, no, no. You know, we had over 100,000 Michigan Democrats in the dead of a Michigan winter drive after work just to register protest votes, which is about 10 times uh, the amount, even if even if they just don't vote at all and don't turn out, uh, that's going to cause uh, that's going to cost uh, Biden that state, that critical swing state. So this is pure politics and that's pathetic. Uh, and it and it's going to open up a precedent that uh, is going to affect all of us as um, as Americans. And then finally, in terms of your original question, what what message does this send? Well, it sends the message to Iran and to Hamas. Hold out. We're winning. Uh, they're willing to sacrifice the Palestinian people to turn world opinion on Israel. And everything Biden's doing is playing right into their hands. And by the way, we just have to continue to remind everyone, Americans are being held hostage right now as we speak in horrific, horrific conditions. Well, there's uh, someone else in the audience watching as well, Congressman, one that you and I have talked about many times. We share uh, the same concern over China. And yesterday, China's leader, Xi Jinping, said at a meeting between China and Arab nations that he supports a Palestinian state. Now, Israel continues to be isolated without strong backing from the United States. China is, is once again, we see them as a puppet master. Well, that's right. And this is what happens when you have weakness in the White House and when you have a weak uh, foreign policy abroad. Uh, bad actors fill the void. Uh, when you have an absence of leadership, China is going to step in. Uh, you know, we see Russia on the march. And uh, I would just say I'll remind everyone of, of China's position. Uh, even in Israeli politics, there are some uh, on their political left that want to be friendlier uh, to China in the long run. And at the end of the day, the United States is, should be. Uh, and as long as me and you and others have a voice in it uh, will be Israel's strongest ally. Be and it's precisely because of our shared values. Uh, and to see right. uh, the Biden administration walk away from that, to see the progressive left walk away, I mean, it it's sad, but it's not surprising because you have a progressive left that believes America is inherently misogynist, racist, and colonialist and views the world through the lens of oppressor and oppressed. 
Uh, and because uh, I guess the you know the Israel and and many Jewish Americans are relatively well off, that puts them in the oppressor class. It's the only way to explain it through their worldview. Uh, it's absolutely wrong, and uh, we'll continue to stand against it. And I think Sp Speaker Johnson's exactly right in bringing the legislation to the floor that would put sanctions on the ICC. Enough is enough. You know, as the the international community continues to back away from Israel, the evidence that they continue to uncover show exactly what Hamas was doing. I mean, we, we've got now, uh, as they've moved into Rafah, they've shut down Hamas's smuggling lines. Uh, reports mm -hmm. now indicate that uh, they have uncovered numerous dozens of tunnels right on the Egyptian border, which is creating greater tension with Egypt. Uh, Egypt even denying that these tunnels, these smuggling routes uh, existed from Egypt into Gaza. Well, yeah, look, Tony, I think we could and should be having behind the scenes uh, a, a much tougher conversation uh, with Egypt, with the Gulf Arab states and others about taking, you know, they they talk publicly a, a talk about uh, the Palestinians, uh, but nobody seems to want to take responsibility for them. Uh, and uh, I think we need to be having much tougher conversations behind the scenes. It is it's just relatively easy, uh, I think, to isolate Netanyahu and then for for China and others to pile on. Uh, but again, you know, for this administration to back away, uh, it, whether it's in the UN, International Criminal Court, Chuck Schumer, the most senior elected Jewish American in uh, Washington, D.C., calling for regime change in the middle of the war. Uh, this is just I, I just don't want to ever hear a single lecture about any kind of political pandering uh, from the Democrats with what we're witnessing right now. And literally lives are at stake. Uh, and the best way that we could support Israel is to do a 180 on our Iran policy and go back to maximum right. pressure, right. cut off the resources and the cash, and allow Israel to finish the job as right. quickly as possible so that then we can talk about humanitarian relief and rebuilding. Uh, Congressman, about 45 seconds left. Yesterday, Israeli's uh, national security advisor said he expects the war to continue through at least the end of the year. Your assessment? Yeah, I think so. This is the the toughest form of warfare. Uh, as you said, Tony, I'm a, a Green Beret by background. And this densely packed urban warfare with miles and miles of tunnels that they've reinforced and built over time, and they're hiding 30,000 plus fighters amongst 3 million civilians, it couldn't get any tougher. Another reason why Israel needs all the support it can get. Yes, our prayers and our political support. Congressman Mike Waltz, always great to talk with you and uh, always appreciate your insights. All right. Thank you, Tony. All right. Congressman Mike Waltz of uh, Florida. Pray. We need to pray. We need to pray for Israel, pray for the peace of that land. We also need to vote. We need to vote for those who will stand with Israel. And then we need to stand. We need to stand with them um, and show our support for them. All right, uh, after the break, encouraging news uh, from my home state of Louisiana. The Ten Commandments making a comeback. That's right. Don't go away. More Washington Watch straight ahead. Download the new Stand Firm app for Apple and Android phones today and join a wonderful community of fellow believers. We've created a special place for you to access news from a biblical perspective, read and listen to daily devotionals, pray for current events, and more. Share the Stand Firm app with your friends, family, and church members, and stand firm everywhere you go. Sometimes the headlines are overwhelming and it feels like we're all alone and there is nothing we can do. That is exactly what the enemy wants us to believe. Reading through the Bible, there are many things that are counterintuitive. One of them is that God never uses a majority. It is always a minority devoted to the truth. 
Here at Family Research Council, we are grateful to stand side by side with other believers for the truth. And as a result, God is making a difference. When you partner with us, you are joining with Christians around the nation in standing together for the truth of God's Word. Supplying pastors and parents and school boards with training and resources to stand up against the indoctrination of our children. Together, with God's help, we can preserve freedom for the next generation. Go to frc.org and become a stand member today. All of us are born with the desire to find truth and meaning. Where did I come from? What happens when I die? While our answers to these questions may divide us, we are united in our need for the freedom to answer life's biggest questions and make life's biggest decisions for ourselves. That's why religious freedom matters for everyone. Religious freedom matters because the powerful have long wanted to control those who are less powerful. Religious freedom matters because the freedom of those who are different is often threatened by those who believe different is dangerous. At the Center for Religious Liberty at Family Research Council, we promote religious freedom for everyone because the only alternative is religious freedom for no one. We encourage Americans and the American government to engage and advocate for the persecuted, and they do. We work every day to bring good news to the afflicted, to proclaim liberty to captives and freedom to prisoners. We do it because that's what Jesus does. We work to give freedom to others because we ourselves have been set free. Welcome back to Washington Watch. Good to have you with us. It's good to be back in the chair. I was up in uh, Nebraska, well, not Nebraska, North Dakota, 50th state. Now, I've now been to all 50 states, and I believe I've spoken in all 50 states. Now, I was up there for the North Dakota Family Policy Alliance uh, for their banquet. Great, uh, great group. And a lot of listeners up there, actually, as well. But And I appreciate Jody always filling in for me. But I'm back, and, uh, and a little bit later, we're going to be talking with Dr. Ben Carson. We're going to be doing an event at our facility in Baton Rouge tonight at the Faith and Freedom Chapel. We'll talk more about that. But first, the anti-Christian left is convulsing over legislation that has been passed by the Louisiana legislature and will be signed most likely next week by the governor. Now, it, it passed this week, and this is what it does. It requires schools that receive public money to post the Ten Commandments in classrooms. Now, 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 just a little history here, okay? This was common until the Supreme Court ruled in 1980 that such a display was in violation of the Establishment Clause of the Constitution. Well, to, uh, to quote President Biden, guess what? A conservative, constitutionally-based Supreme Court has ruled repeatedly in favor of the First Amendment's Exercise Clause. So, it's a new day for religious freedom in America. So, we need to seize the moment, which is what my next guest has done. Joining me now is uh, the author of the bill, Louisiana State Representative Dodie Horton. She represents Louisiana's 9th District in the House. Uh, Representative Horton, welcome to Washington Watch. Great to see you. It's great being here. I'm a huge fan, and thank you for all your service and all you do for, in order well, to make our country great again. Well, thank you, Dodie. I appreciate that. But let me congratulate you on the progress you've made on this bill. Now, I want to ask you, and, and, and I, I know the answer, but why was this so important? We, we wanted to uh, get the Ten Commandments back in the classroom where they were, and they hung for almost three decades. Uh, it's we want our children to see uh, what God's standard for our moral conduct is. We're not asking the teachers to teach it, but we want our children to be able to see one that there is a God and that he does have a moral standard than which they need to conduct themselves by. Well, so. you know, it's interesting. You say you're not going to teach it. 
and you know we've got all of the leftist groups here going crazy, uh, the Southern mm -hmm. Impoverished Law Center, all these anti-Christian organizations. But in Utah, in March of this year, they actually passed a law to teach the Ten Commandments because it's fundamental to American history. And if you actually go back to George Washington's farewell address to the nation, you know, he, he says that, you know, there's these two, two suppositions that morality and religion, uh, those two things are what we base our political prosperity upon. And he says, don't think you can have one without the other. And when we look at what's happening in our schools, we look at what is happening in our culture, and we wring our hands and, and policymakers try to figure out what they're going to do to correct you know, the, the lawlessness, you know, it's pretty simple. Go back to the Ten Commandments and teach them that there is truth and we're accountable to it. I agree, absolutely do, and I'm proud of Utah, you know, and uh, I look forward to that being our next step. And uh, we just, you know, we wanted to make sure we got them back in the classroom and I'm thankful for our uh, Republican supermajority in both houses and having a, a governor now that supports these type of uh, issues. Uh, I'm thrilled that our students will once again be able to see the Ten Commandments in their classrooms. I look forward to the day of hanging the first one, one of my public schools at home. Well, I, I remember my, my uh, former seatmate when I was in the House, um, A.G. Crow, passed legislation to put In God We Trust in the classrooms. And, of course, that was a stretch back then. So we're seeing the progression, of course— as I mentioned in the opening, the court has changed, and so there is a, this is a new day for religious freedom. And I, I think uh, I want to ask you, did that factor into your decision to move forward with this, given that so many people say, well, this is unconstitutional, it's going to be challenged in court, but we've got a new court. We do, praise God. And uh, we definitely feel like we're going to meet that challenge. We're focused on the historical aspect of the Ten Commandments. Uh, in which all of our laws uh, are derived from. And we also included that if a school would like to put up other historical documents like the Mayfield Flower Compact, uh, the Northwest Ordinance, the Bill of Rights, they're able to do so. But hanging the Ten Commandments in the classroom in a prominent location is a mandate. And uh, so we feel like it will stand up to the historical challenge that's coming. So, so let me ask you this, Representative Horton. Um, through the process, and I know you know you had this in committee, had it on the House floor, yes. went to the Senate committee. Uh, was there anything in the opposition that was stated that surprised you? Like you, you'd like, I can't believe this. Not really. Uh, I'm I'm used to carrying legislation that the left absolutely abhors, and so from from uh, having legislation this year, will be signing a law that they people cannot indoctrinate our children in the classroom to. Uh, standing on our, you know, biblical beliefs. I, I'm used to that type of attack. And unfortunately, um, they didn't hold back on this one either, you know. And so uh, our children deserve all that we can give them. I've been wanting to get God back in the classroom since it was removed uh, many moons ago. So this is, this is progress, and it's just a great day for our Louisiana students. And I'm so excited that Louisiana is going to take the lead in this model legislation. Well, again, um, I commend you, uh, Representative Horton, for taking the lead on this, because I, too, am excited that Louisiana is leading in an area that I think is, is fundamental, addressing the moral foundation, and then the other pieces fall into place. And so I know we've got a great governor. Nice we've time. got a great attorney general who will defend this in court, Liz Morrell. And uh, so yeah. it's a new day in Louisiana, it's a new day in America, and we need to fight for these things we believe in, and you're doing just that. So again, congratulations, and thank you for fighting for what is right and what we believe in. Thank you. Thank you. It's an honor to serve my district, and it's an honor to be able, I just want to glorify God by the way I serve, and thank you for your example of leadership. We all look up to you tremendously. Well, thank you. And uh, thank we'll you. be watching for that to be signed into law probably uh, first part of next week. Folks, I, I can't tell you how encouraged I am to see what's happened in my state of Louisiana over the last 25 years. It was hard ground when I first got elected. But we're seeing more and more men and women like Dodie who love the Lord, following the Lord, and not afraid. Not afraid. We're going to talk about that a little bit later when Dr. Carson joins me. But after the break, we're going to get an update from the World Health Assembly in Geneva. That's right. Travis Weber is going to be joining us from Geneva with an update 
on the Who's Global Power Grab. That's next here on Washington Watch. Don't go away. Everything we do begins as an idea. Before there can be acts of courage, there must be the belief that some things are worth sacrificing for. Before there can be marriage, there is the idea that man should not be alone. Before there was freedom, there was the idea that individuals are created equal. It's true that all ideas have consequences, but we're less aware that all consequences are the fruit of ideas. Before there was murder, there was hate. Before there was a holocaust, there was the belief by some people that other people are undesirable. Our beliefs determine our behavior, and our beliefs about life's biggest questions determine our worldview. Where did I come from? Who decides what is right and wrong? What happens when I die? Our answers to these questions explain why people see the world so differently. Debates about abortion are really disagreements about where life gets its value. Debates over sexuality and gender and marriage are really disagreements about whether the rules are made by us or for us. What we think of as political debates are often much more than that. They're disagreements about the purpose of our lives and the source of truth. As Christians, our goal must be to think biblically about everything. Our goal is to help you see beyond red and blue, left and right, to see the battle of ideas at the root of it all. Our goal is to equip Christians with a biblical worldview and help them advance and defend the faith in their families, communities, and the public square. Cultural renewal doesn't begin with campaigns and elections. It begins with individuals turning from lies to truth. But that won't happen if people can't recognize a lie and don't believe truth exists. We want to help you see the spiritual war behind the political war, the truth claims behind the press release, and the forest from the trees. Stopping the WHO's global power grab. On the ground in Geneva. All right, as the 77th World Health Assembly continues in Geneva, there appears to be a shift in focus to amending the international health regulations, the IHR, while letting the pandemic agreement simmer for now. The support is just not there at present. Well, as in previous days, Israel continues to be criticized. Um, they don't want to miss an opportunity to do that. And U.S. officials have talked about sexual and reproductive health almost every chance they get. So before I bring in our own Travis Weber, who is there on the ground in Geneva, I want to give you this uh, keyword to text. Text WHO to 67742 to keep up on what is happening in Geneva with the World Health Organization and their global power grab. Again, that's WHO to 67742. Well, joining me now from Geneva to discuss this is Washington Stand Policy Editor Travis Weber, who also serves as Vice President for Policy and Government Affairs here at the Family Research Council. In addition to joining us on Washington Watch Daily this week, he's providing regular updates at the Washington Stands. Uh, Washington stand for reports, photos, and other media from Travis. Again, text WHO to 67742. You can also find all this on the Stand Firm app as well. Travis, good to see you again. Thank you, Tony. Good to be with you. Okay, so uh, what have uh, what have, what have you witnessed there today? It's about 9:30. Uh, well, it's actually later than that. Uh, what, what have you seen today? Yeah, so today uh, we saw more of the um, different committees meeting at uh, the World Health Assembly, the 77th World Health Assembly. I was in what was known as Committee A. This was a lot of member states participating in speeches about agenda items. One of them was what the member states were doing to cooperate with the UN Sustainable Development Goal 3.1 to reduce maternal mortality. That sounds like a good goal. But what you heard was how they were approaching it today. A lot of references to sexual reproductive health, references to universal health coverage. And if you look at a resolution that the United States and other countries are on, it's peppered with that type of language and that approach to the goal. And so the way in which governments are coming at this is very uniform, monolithic, and driven by an approach that, you know, for the believer, the 
Bible-based believer hearing this thinking, whoa, that is not how God approaches the issue. So you have heard a lot of that today. Um, in well, addition to that, well, there when, is a drafting well, group, uh, let, let a me, private group meeting. Let me stop you there for just a second, Travis. So, so when they're talking about this reproductive health, I mean, the, 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 we're talking about abortion as well, right? Right, right. It's abortion and, and sexual ideologies, the, the trans um, transgender-related provision of services that drive an approach that says that is part of healthcare, and that's really what we're looking at. Here. So, so, so they're looking to use global leverage to force this on member states, right? That that's that's true. Yeah. All right. So go ahead. What what else did you uncover today? Yeah. So besides that, Tony, um, you know, we're we're waiting on the results of a a private set of meetings uh, regarding an, an approach. They're gonna. There's been a drafting group tasked with developing an approach on the way ahead on the IHR, IHR amendments and the pandemic agreement. It looks like the pandemic agreement is done for this assembly. We don't know that for sure. It's likely done. The IHR amendments, there's an effort to get them passed, but there's a lot of concerns with those as well uh, in the area of sovereignty. And there's points of disagreement between member states, including the definition of a pandemic emergency, how it will be funded, and who's going to share what resources with what country. So the states have a lot to hash out. I think we might see some of this disagreement come out into the open tomorrow. We'll have to wait and see on that. So how much longer will the assembly be meeting? Until June 1st. All right. What? Uh, so it, it looks like, as we talked about at the top of, the, of uh, this segment, that the pandemic accord treaty uh, is kind of being pushed aside because of some areas of disagreement, but they're really pressing in on these amendments to the international health, health regulations? That is accurate. You know, and, and nations are all in agreement on a desire to see some sort of pandemic agreement and see inter health, international health regulation amendments. There's no there's not really any disagreement there. I mean, there are some skeptical comments. I heard Argentina say they're not sure that this pandemic treatment process is the right way to tackle another emergency. But by and large, you hear favorable comments from the delegates. Now, the areas of disagreement, though, are in how long and what process should be used to get things done. By and large, it's seen as not possible to reach agreement on the pandemic agreement, this World Health Assembly, the IHR amendments, it's the jury's still out on that. And Tony, just a note on this, it's important to understand the way things are operating here is they're really looking for uniform agreement before moving something. Um, they're looking for consensus. So as long as there's disagreements between member states, there seems like there's a reluctance by the WHO to advance a measure forward. All right, 30 seconds left, uh, Travis. Uh, anything bizarre today that you ran across? I mean, we saw references by to animal health about the rights of animals to receive relief um, under theories put forth by the UK and Belgium. I mean, this is interesting language when we're talking about an organization that should be that's serving the needs of humans worldwide. Uh, that is a bit bizarre. Um, I wonder what they mean. Of course, uh, one Health is a part of the pandemic accord, which views everything the same, which obviously is totally counter to scripture, as man is the one created in the image of God. Travis Weber, always great to see you. Uh, stay safe, and uh, we'll get an update tomorrow. Thank you. All right, folks, don't go away. On the other side of the break, Dr. Ben Carson joins me here in studio as we talk about his new book. And also, he'll be joining me tonight for a conversation at our Faith and Freedom Chapel in Baton Rouge. We're going to talk about that next here on Washington Watch. Don't go away. More straight ahead. America was a bright light until the culture gave into darkness. But we won't. We are in a battle for the soul of our nation, between right and wrong, between truth and lies. At a time when the mainstream media is blocking Americans from truth, millions are searching for a source of trustworthy news that shines a light in the darkness. At this time of great need, FRC is lighting the way forward. For 40 years, Family Research Council and its partners have stood together to advance and defend biblical truth in government and culture. 
between our flagship broadcast program, Washington Watch, with Tony Perkins, to our news outlet, The Washington Stand, FRC is providing believers across the country with news they can trust from a biblical worldview. When you stand with FRC, you help light the way forward for America and the next generation. Go to frc.org slash give. Jesus said in John 15, These things I have spoken to you, that my joy may remain in you, and that your joy may be full. In 2024, in these divided and uncertain times, how can this be possible? By abiding in Him through His Word. At Family Research Council, we want to help you do that, which is the reason for the Stand on the Word Bible Reading Plan. In just 10 to 15 minutes each day, you will have read the entire Bible in just two years. But more importantly, you will be abiding in Him daily. Find our Bible reading plan at frc.org slash Bible. And join Tony Perkins each weekday for a 10-minute devotional inspired by the daily reading and designed to encourage you on this journey through the Bible. Listen on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and YouTube. And remember, the grass withers and the flower fades, but the Word of our God will stand forever. Research has found that there are 59 million American adults who are a lot like you. There are millions of people around the country who are born again, deeply committed to practicing their faith, and believe the Bible is the reliable Word of God. But that's not all. They're also engaged in our government. They're voters. They're more likely to be involved in their community, and they're making a difference in elections. The problem is that a lot of them feel alone too. We want to change that. FRC wants to connect these 59 million Americans to speak the truth together, no matter the cost. If you want to learn more about this group and what it means to be a spiritually active, governance-engaged conservative, or if you want to find out if you are one of these sage cons yourself, join us. Go to frc.org slash s-a-g-e-c-o-n, sage con, to learn more. That's s-a-g-e-c-o-n, sage con, to learn more. Welcome back to Washington Watch. I'm your host, Tony Perkins. Good to be back in the chair. I appreciate Jody Heiss once again filling in for me while I was out. Hey, this, this evening, big evening here in, uh, in Baton Rouge at the Faith and Freedom Chapel for the Family Research Council. I'll be joined by my good friend, Dr. Ben Carson. We'll be having a conversation. You know, with the world turning against Israel, the upcoming elections and the attacks on faith continuing daily, our country stands at a crossroads, and some Christians, frankly, feel discouraged. They want to pack up and, and leave. But there is hope rooted in Scripture that we can restore our country uh, the, to the biblical values, the biblical foundation that our nation was built upon. Well, joining me now to discuss this and much more, Dr. Ben Carson. He is the former Secretary of Housing and Urban Development. A 2016 Republican presidential candidate and a pioneering former director of pediatric neurosurgery at Johns Hopkins. He is now the founder and chairman of the American Cornerstone Institute and also the author of a new book that I'm going to tell you about in just a moment. Dr. Carson, welcome back to Washington Watch. Great to have you in the studio. It's always good to be with you, especially in person. It is. It is. I always like that. It's much better. Uh, I like Zoom. Zoom is helpful, but uh, in person is even better. No question about it. So let's talk about, first, the new book you have coming up, America's Perilous Fight, and it is Overcoming Our Culture's War on the American Family. You and your wife, Candy, wrote the book. Tell us why. Well, <clears throat> our country was born in the crucible of war. Uh, we didn't gain all of our freedoms because somebody gave them to us. We fought for them. And uh, <clears throat> we're in a situation now where we have to know that we're in a battle for the soul of our nation. You know, Benjamin Franklin, when he came out of that Constitution Hall in 1787, he was asked, Sir, what do we have here, a monarchy or a republic? He said, a republic, if you can keep it. Right. And, uh, you know, we're getting pretty close to losing it now. Uh, you know, our founders worked very hard to make sure that this was a country that was of, by, and for the people. 
Marxism is working very hard to make sure it's a country that's up for, by and for the government. Right. And uh, if you want to really change us, to fundamentally change us, what do you do? Well, you're probably not going to overcome us militarily. However, you might be able to do it from inside. And the key fundamental baseline element of our strength are our families. And uh, if you can destroy that inner working strength of the fabric of our foundation, then you can destroy the country. And you look at all the things that are happening, and you look at the advantages that children have who are raised in a traditional nuclear family with father and mother. That's called privilege. <laughs> right? I mean, that's what the left calls it. If you, if you grow up in a family where your dad stays with your family, married to your mom, somehow today that's considered to be privileged. Right. right. And it's blessed, but I wouldn't necessarily call it. It's the way it should be. It's, it's the, the way, way it should be. be. It's, the, it's the foundation that God established for us. And interestingly enough, both the liberal and the conservative think tanks and research organizations all show the same thing. And that is children who are raised in those families four times less likely to live in poverty, seven times less likely to have teenage pregnancy, uh, much better academic uh, performance. And those pathologies have only been trending in the wrong direction. Right. I mean, when I authored the nation's first covenant marriage law here mm -hmm. in Louisiana back in 1997, I used those same statistics, but they were not as bad as they are today. And the covenant marriage law was designed to strengthen marriage prepare young people for right. marriage so that they would stay married and their kids would have the benefit of an intact home. Right. Because uh, the, the numbers show, they don't lie. Well, the, the, the whole concept of the having to hold until death do us part has changed to having to hold until you get irritated with each other. Right. And, you know, the fact of the matter is you take two people from different environments, gonna there's going to be friction. There's going to be friction. But you've got to work through it. I always say it's like rubbing two pieces of sandpaper together. But if you keep rubbing them, they Amazingly, get smooth. They get smooth. That's right. <laughs> so it, it's not only the family that we see the left coming after, but it is faith, the Christian Absolutely. faith in particular, because Marxism has shown us historically that in order for the government to dominate, it has to take out these other institutions, right. which is the family, which is... Uh, the, the, the church, mm -hmm. and, and even self-government so that people become more reliant upon government. That is absolutely their key premise, get rid of God. Uh, communism, obviously, big component of, of that there, too. And, you know, what we talk about in the book is how that has declined. You go back to 1972, 90% of the population... <clears throat> Uh, identified as Christians. Right. Fifty years later, sixty-three percent. Right. Well, and that goes back to our schools in part, right? Because the the year before I was born, uh, prayer was taken out, or Bible was taken out of our schools. The next year, prayer was taken out of right. our schools, and so I mean that has been the one common really denominator, if you will, of our society has been our public education system. Exactly. And we've kicked God out of there. We've taken the Ten Commandments out in the 1980s. And in fact, early in the program, I talked about how here in Louisiana, they're putting them back in. Are they? They are. So some good things are happening <laughs> as believers like yourself, myself, as we step into the arena and not criticize and commentate on the chaos, but we actually solve problems. Well, that's so encouraging to hear that that's happening because what I found when I was running for president is that most of the people actually had common sense and they had some values. What they didn't have was courage. Yeah. They didn't step up and so advocate for what so they believed in. So true. And if we don't do that this time around, I'm afraid it may be too late. Yeah. I, I want to play a clip, speaking of that, I want to play a clip. This is from yesterday. Um, you mentioned something a moment ago, and I, I don't think I have this clip uh, uh, accessible right now, but you used a phrase that President Joe Biden uses frequently, that we are in a battle for the soul of our nation. And, you know, I don't agree with him on anything, hardly, but that I do agree with. Right. And I found something I actually agree with 
his wife about. She was on The View yesterday, and she said this. Play clip number eight. Those polls are going to turn. I'm confident of it because... As time goes on and as people start to focus a little bit more about mm -hmm. what's at stake and start to become educated on the issues and the differences between the, the two men, I believe that Americans are going to choose good over evil. Well, this is a choice between good no and evil. So she got that part right on the out of view uh, program. Well, well think about it. There's one side that wants to save lives. There's another side that says, you can take a baby. And I've operated on babies that were 25, 26, 27, 28 weeks gestation. And you have to give them anesthesia. Right. They, they can, can fill everything. You have a side that says, don't give them any anesthesia and rip them to pieces while they're still alive. Now, I wonder which side that is. Is that good or the evil? And, and, and by the way, that's all the way up till birth. Yes. Right up to birth. I don't even understand how anybody can, can, can countenance that. Right. And the law doesn't, really, because if you're accused of murdering a pregnant woman, you get two counts of murder. Right. right. <laughs> you're right. There's no consistency in that, Dr. Right. Carson, as we've moved away from truth as the foundation for our judicial system, which we're seeing uh, this uh, two-tiered system of justice emerging in our country. But I want to go back to the choices between good and evil, because right. I do believe that this fall's election is going to be between good and evil. Now, I'm not going to say that necessarily in terms of the, the, the people and personalities, but the parties have mm -hmm. two very clear contrasting visions of the world. As you just pointed out, Democrats in their party platform talk about the abortion until birth at taxpayer funds. Right. Republicans, on the other hand, understand that a child in the womb needs to be protected. But there's much more beyond that. I mean, we're debating now whether or not children, minors, can have sex change surgeries. And, you know, the human brain does not fully develop until the mid to late 20s. Right. Some people it never fully develops, but <laughs> I mean, it's quite I'm not going to say what political party they're in, but <laughs> yes, that's happening. But if, if that's the case, you're asking 9, 10, 11, 12, 13-year-old people who have non-developed brains to make life-changing decisions that will affect they, they, them. They cannot, be, they, they cannot change back, and exactly. many of these things are, are irreversible in terms of the surgeries and right. the medications. And some are. of it is done without the knowledge of the parents. So, so we won't let children get tattoos in most states. We won't right. let them drive until a certain age, all right. because of the maturity issue. We won't let them join the military until a certain age. Right. So many restrictions, but yet we will let them cut off healthy body parts? It really is absurd. Makes, Makes no, no sense, sense at all. And they always like to say, well, we're following the science. The science says if you have two X chromosomes, you're female. And if you have an X and a Y, you're a male. Um, it's a binary choice. That's the way God made us. And to say that you can just by your emotional state change that, is completely non-scientific. Right. Uh, uh, by the way, folks, I'm talking with Dr. Ben Carson, new book out, The Perilous Fight, Overcoming Our Culture's War on the American Family. In fact, tonight we're going we're gonna to talk about much more as we host Dr. Carson uh, for a conversation at the Faith and Freedom Chapel here in Baton Rouge, FRC's Faith and Freedom Chapel. If you would like to find out more, it's 8 p.m. Eastern time. Now, I know you're not going to be able to get here in time, no matter where you're coming from in the country, but you can actually watch online and ask questions. You just need to download the Stand Firm app, the new digital platform, our new app, Stand Firm. Go to the, the App Store and download the Stand Firm app, and you can actually watch it as you... Uh, Become a member of the Stand Firm uh, app, and you can ask questions of that. So we're going to talk on a lot of stuff tonight, Dr. Carson. But I, I want to explore just a little bit further the, the issue of life. You've been very outspoken on that issue. And since Dobbs, two years yeah. ago, we've seen overturned Roe, I think, corrected the case. Um, 
Maybe the nation wasn't ready for it. Certainly the political class was not right. because many of them have run from that issue. But this is something we should embrace and continue to build a culture of life. Absolutely, Absolutely we should. And we shouldn't fight amongst ourselves. You know, there are some people who say conception, some say six weeks, some say 15 weeks. We're all under the same umbrella of believing that life is important, that we should protect it. And we should keep fighting it at every level until we have a society that respects life. It's building a consensus. I mean, you've watched this develop. I watched it develop. I was a part of that in terms of educating the, the public technology. Science brought right. the American public to a greater understanding of the humanity of the unborn child. And so we saw the, the country move in this direction. There's no reason to run from right. what the court did. The court put it back into the hands of policymakers. We've got to continue to do the work in the pro-life movement, but we also have to do the work legislatively as well. Well, also, let's just be logical about this. What about all those people who are trying to save snail darters? Now, a snail darter is considerably less complex than a fetus, uh, even at a few weeks. So... Why are you trying to save the one and not the other? I'd like to hear an explanation for that. I'd like to hear an explanation for a lot of things, like uh, what is wrong with thou shall not kill, thou shall not steal, thou shall not commit adultery, thou shall not uh, bear false witness or envy, you know, or, and why not respect your parents? What's wrong with that? Right. Well, you know, if we, if we abided by those 10, we would have a lot less in terms of laws and statutes on the book on the books. Yes, exactly. Um, I was just having that conversation with my son earlier today. Uh, a new law went into effect in, in Louisiana, and we were just discussing, this was about, uh, you have to stay, I think, 50 feet back from a police officer, and having been a police officer, have two kids in law enforcement. Uh, that, that's great, but you wouldn't need it no. if we abided by the basics. And the problem is we have lawlessness in our society, and it goes right back to what you talked about in your book, The Family. Right. And I hear people saying, your truth and my truth. What about the truth? Right. We know what the truth is. Before we run out of time, Dr. Carson, how can folks get a copy of the book, America's Perilous Fight? It's uh, everywhere books are sold. Uh, you can also get it uh, through Amazon and various online uh, vendors. And audio books are available as well. And if you're coming tonight, you'll uh, be able to get a copy and get it signed with Dr. Carson. But also, I encourage you, wherever you are in America, you can join us tonight and be a part of our conversation with Dr. Ben Carson. Simply go to the App Store and download the Stand Firm app. You'll be able to ask questions. Dr. Carson will be speaking, and then we'll be taking uh, questions from our audience. Uh, Dr. Carson, we're, we're, we're out of time for today but there's more tonight absolutely this is fantastic so i look forward <laughs> to continuing our conversation this evening at uh, here at the faith family and freedom chapel i hope everybody will join us thank you so much all right dr ben carson uh thank you for all that you do for our country thank you. and folks i encourage you to get a copy of his book the perilous fight and also tune in tonight and be a part of our conversation again to find out more about how you can uh, join us Download the Stand Firm app in the App Store and you'll be able to tune in and watch our conversation tonight at 8 p.m. Eastern Time, 7 Central. You also have to ask, ask questions. Until next time, I leave you with the words of the Apostle Paul who says when you've done everything you can do, when you've prayed, when you've prepared, and when you've taken your stand, by all means, keep standing. Washington Watch with Tony Perkins is brought to you by Family Research Council and is entirely listener supported. Portions of the show discussing candidates are brought to you by Family Research Council Action. For more information on anything you've heard today or to find out how you can partner with us in our ongoing efforts to promote faith, family, and freedom, visit TonyPerkins.com. Also, to leave a comment about Washington Watch, call our watch line at 1-866-372-7234. That's 1-866-372-7234.